If you feel a deep pain in your butt, then there's a good chance you've come across the term piriformis syndrome or deep gluteal syndrome. You might have even been diagnosed with this condition. However, in the majority of cases, this diagnosis is incorrect. In this video, you will find out why this is the case. And at the end of the video, I'll show you what the best treatment for this condition looks like, according to science. I've divided this video into three parts. First, we'll look at the background of this condition, then the diagnosis, and at the end, the treatment. If you're new here, my name is Gino, I'm a sports physiotherapist, and on this channel you will get evidence-based tips about pain, injury, and rehabilitation. If you're interested in that, consider subscribing. Okay, let's start with the background. The piriformis muscle extends from the sacrum to the hip joint. Since the sciatic nerve runs underneath it, it is believed that a tense piriformis muscle could pinch the sciatic nerve, causing pain in the butt and the back of the leg. Researchers have even found anatomical variations where the sciatic nerve runs directly through the muscle, theoretically making the sciatic nerve more susceptible. There are several body parts that could pinch the sciatic nerve, like the gamelli obturator internus complex, the hamstrings, fibrous bands with blood vessels, vascular changes and space occupying lesions. Therefore, experts now prefer the term deep gluteal syndrome. A study done by Bartred et al. in 2018 examined 1039 adult hips with an MRI. They found that about 20% of the people had variations in the sciatic nerve that could make the nerve more susceptible to pressure from the piriformis muscle. That would be type 2 in the image. However, and that's the most important part, they found no correlation between these variants of the sciatic nerve and piriformis syndrome. Piriformis syndrome is defined as the compression of the sciatic nerve by the piriformis muscle. When a nerve is pinched and irritated, patients report symptoms such as tingling or loss of sensation and strength in the area supplied by the nerve. Nerve pain typically has burning, electrical or stabbing quality However, most people who report piriformis syndrome experience only deep pain in the butt and at most radiating pain in the back of the thigh. At this point, we have to ask ourselves the question, if the pain stays more or less in the same area and has a different quality than nerve pain, how can the sciatic nerve be affected? In patients who indeed suffer from true sciatica, it is believed that only 6 to 8% have piriformis syndrome. That's a study done by Bartred et al. in 2018. This means that in the vast majority of cases, other underlying causes for sciatica are present, mainly a compression of the nerve root due to herniated discs or foraminal stenosis. By the way, in many ways diagnosing a piriformis syndrome in the lower limb is comparable to a thoracic outlet syndrome in the upper extremity. This diagnosis makes sense from an anatomical perspective, but both are exclusion diagnoses and are heavily debated by experts in the field. In patients who do undergo imaging or surgery, it often turns out that the cause is a nerve root compression. Alright, that was part one, let's continue with part two, the diagnosis. Our first priority would be to look at the lumbar spine, which often causes pain in the butt area. We should also have a look at the sacroiliac joint because that can also be a source of pain. The Laslet cluster can be really helpful in making this hypothesis more or less likely. Now we move on to what we see most often in practice, muscle pain in the deep gluteal area, also known as myofascial pain. One way to confirm this diagnosis is to stretch and contract the deep external hip rotators. This should elicit symptoms deep in the butt. Provocation tests like the active straight leg raise can also be used to see if tension on the nerve produces this recognizable butt pain. And of course you can also use manual palpation, so pressure in that gluteal area to see if that elicits the pain. Very important though, make sure you compare the right side to the left side. Use the same pressure and if both sides hurt more or less the same, then it's probably a negative diagnosis. You might ask yourself, why do muscles even become painful? As mentioned in previous videos, this is usually the result of pain and not the cause of pain. 
your body wants to protect you so if you experience pain your muscles will tension up to make sure you don't hurt yourself anymore please be aware of the fact that psychosocial and environmental factors can also influence your pain experience that means that you may experience pain differently because you slept less or poorly because you have anxiety depression etc let's continue with part three the treatment if you have severe pain, then you want short-term pain relief. And that's what I would focus on right at the beginning. There are many ways to achieve this. For example, manual pressure in the painful area, dry needling, heat, foam rolling, or stretching of the deep glute muscles. For example, by performing the pigeon stretch that you probably know already. I would also recommend that you reduce activities that worsen your butt pain. If sitting really provokes your symptoms, then you can try changing your body position as often as possible. Try to go from sitting to standing as often as you can, or maybe work with weight bearing a little bit, go more on the left side and then a little bit more on the right side of the butt. Another thing that can really help if you sit a lot is a well padded cushion that you place below your butt. If you always get symptoms when lying on your side in bed then what can really help is placing a pillow in between your knees. That is an easy way how you can reduce prolonged stretching of the glute muscles. If running or walking is painful at the moment then temporarily reduce your running or walking volume to a tolerable level. The long-term solution, however, should be a progressive exercise program targeting the painful area. One very important thing to consider, though, is that the pain of the exercises should be tolerable. Your pain level should be between 0 to 2 out of 10 during and 24 hours after exercise. If your pain level is between 3 and 5, that's still acceptable, but I might dial it down a little bit. If your pain level is above 5, you've definitely done too much. Now I want to give you a quick exercise exercise progression that you can work with. Start with the first exercise and work your way down to the last exercise and always check in with your symptoms. At the beginning you could perform exercises like clamshells, glute bridges or hip thrusts. Afterwards you can do things like box squats, if those work well, then you can work in the full range of motion and do regular back squats or front squats. And in the last stage, I would work with split squats or even front foot elevated split squats. Depending on how intense your symptoms are at the moment, I would pick one to two of those exercises, perform them two to three times per week at three sets of 12 repetitions. The key thing is just that you look at your symptoms, don't overdo it and progress over time. If you want to find out what the top nine pain myths are that you should stop believing in right now, then check out this video now. As always, thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in the next one.